The following is a new seven black history special, Black Slaves, Red Masters. Hello everyone, I'm Sam Ford. Earlier this month in our Seven Inside Reports, I took a personal journey to look at a largely unknown chapter of black history when my ancestors and thousands of other blacks were slaves, not of the whites, but of the Indians. Well, a lot of people responded who'd missed some of the segments and who wanted to know more about the subject. So today you'll see it all and more and get your pencils. At the end we'll have not a test, but an address and phone number where you can get more information. Every summer at Tahlequah, Oklahoma, the Cherokee Indians sponsor their Trail of Tears pageant, the story of how the U.S. government robbed the so-called five civilized tribes of their homelands in the south and moved them by force to Oklahoma. They don't tell about the thousands of blacks the tribes brought with them, their slaves. My mammy and pappy belonged to a part Cherokee named W.P. Thompson when I was born. The woman reading is my sister, Elaine Ford Staten, but the words are those of our great-grandmother, Phyllis Thompson Pettit, whose Georgia-born parents were brought by the Cherokees over the trail. Johnson Thompson was Phyllis's brother. Before that, Pappy had been owned by three different masters. One was the rich Joe Van, who lived down at Weber's Fall, and another was Chief Lowry of the Cherokees. My cousin, Maurice Shepard, reading the words of his great-grandfather. The interviews were conducted 52 years ago here at Fort Gibson, Oklahoma, when both my great-grandmother Phyllis Pettit and her brother Johnson Thompson were in their 80s, part of a federal writer's project. Now, both of them are buried in this cemetery. But after I read their words, I was set on a mission to find out how my family became slaves of the Indians. I learned that beginning with the administration of George Washington, it was the policy of the U.S. government to civilize the Indians by teaching them modern farming techniques. To adopt agricultural practices that uh, patterned uh, after the whites, and one of those in the South was slave trade. I don't ever talk about it very much because I think it's a very shameful part of, um, of Cherokee history, and so I've purposely avoided involving myself in that, um, in that whole issue. While the current chief may be ashamed, at the Cherokee Museum today are slave bills of sale, including one for three slaves bought in 1841 by then-principal chief John Ross. The chief and his brother Lewis were among the biggest slaveholders in the tribe. Indeed, many of my mother, Kathleen's ancestors, the Rosses, were owned by the chief's family. They were Southerners. They uh, adopted Southern institutions, Southern dress southern uh, black slavery. But one characteristic they did not like was southern greed for their land. By 1830, through wars and treaties, the five tribes had lost most of it. Then they were all ordered to move west to Oklahoma. Four of the tribes left, but the Cherokees took their case to the U.S. Supreme Court and won. At least they won the lawsuit. Then the man on the $20 bill stepped in. And President uh, Jackson essentially told the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court, uh, uh, you know, you made your ruling in favor of the Cherokees, now, you know, try to enforce it. As president, Andrew Jackson controlled the army, so 14,000 Cherokees and 1,600 slaves were herded to Oklahoma, some groups in winter, with about a quarter of the Indians and blacks dying along the way. You got plenty of Indians right today don't like Andrew Jackson in this area. 84-year-old Luther Scales, who describes himself as one-quarter black and three-quarters Indian, is president of the Coweta, Oklahoma Historical Society. He remembers stories his Creek Indian grandfather told him about the removal, which was devastating for the Creeks as well. He said the, 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 the roughest part of it was crossing the Mississippi River in a boat. How so? Well, man, the Mississippi River, do you know down there in, uh, in Arkansas and in, in Mississippi, when you, and you're talking about a mile across, a mile, mile or so across the river. And in, 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 in a boat, as soon as that water running, well, you got problems. Once in Oklahoma, the slaves were put to work, raising cotton, building the new nations. The Merle home, which still stands outside Tahlequah, Oklahoma, was built by the Cherokees' black slaves. And should you think the Indians were much kinder masters than the whites, listen to Granny Phyllis's words in the interview about my great-grandfather. My husband was George Pettit. 
He tell me his mammy was sold away from him when he was a little boy. He looked down a long lane after her just as long as he could see her and cried after her. He went down to the big road and sat down by his mammy's barefoot tracks in the sand and sat there until it got dark. And then he come on back to the quarters. Oklahomans reenacting the Civil War Battle of Honey Springs. When it actually occurred, this was the Creek Nation in Indian Territory, slave territory, in which all of the five civilized tribes had signed treaties supporting the South. And the battle actually looked much like something out of the movie Glory, except it wasn't the 54th Massachusetts, but the first Kansas colored regiment that saved the day. Because of fear of attacks from nearby Kansas, many Indian slave owners fled South. I can just remember when Master John Harnish took us to Texas. We went in a covered wagon with oxen and camped out all along the way. My sister, Elaine Ford Staten, reading the words of our great-grandmother, Phyllis Pettit, a girl at the time of the war. In ex-slave interviews conducted by federal workers during the Depression, she told how her brother, Johnson Thompson, and her parents were sold from one Cherokee master to another and taken to Texas. And Pappy done the driving of the oxen. I was set in a wagon and listened to him pop his whip and holler. On the square of the old Cherokee capital in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, stands a monument to Cherokee Confederate war dead. But the war here was confusing. While Cherokee chief John Ross was arrested by the Union Army and shipped to D.C., his mansion was burned to the ground by Cherokee Confederate General Stan Wadey, who just didn't like the chief. And while Creek Chief Samuel Chakoti fought for the South, Apothelea Hola, another Creek chief, fought for the Union, his slaves at his side. In any event, when the war was over, the tribes who'd all signed Confederate treaties were in trouble. The United States government informed the five civilized tribes that all previous treaties are null and void. And the first thing to be accomplished is to sign a peace treaty. The new treaties meant the Indians lost more land. And since this wasn't legally considered the United States, Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation had not covered Indian slaves. So the treaty said they had to be freed. One of the things the federal government required in those treaties was that, that these tribes adopt the blacks as equal members of the tribe, their former slaves. One day, old master stayed after he ate breakfast. And when us Negroes come in to eat, he said, after today, I ain't your master anymore. You all as free as I am. We just stand and look and don't know what to say about it. The words of her brother, Johnson Thompson, read by his great-grandson, Maurice Shepard. Pappy wanted to go back to his mother when the war was over and the slaves were freed. He made a deal with Dave Mounts, a white man who was moving into the Indian country to drive for him. Granny Phyllis described a harrowing trip in which they had to fight off wolves with fire from their camp, a wagon journey over land and water that lasted five weeks. When we would come to a river, we were crossing boats but me and brother rode on a bed in the back of the wagon and when we were crossing a river father would make us lie down and wouldn't let us look out he was afraid we would fall out in the river finally they arrived back to Fort Gibson in northeastern Oklahoma where their father's mother was working as a cook for the US soldiers my grandma Phyllis Harnish was the mother of the colored Baptist Church on four mile branch east of Fort Gibson she organized the church and was head of it as long as she lived. Since the Cherokee tribe owned all the land, as new Cherokee citizens, the family merely picked a spot. After Granny Phyllis Pettit married, her first child was my grandmother, Lutetia, whose third child was my dad, Sammy. Pettits and Fords still own this land today. Our Black History Special will continue in just a moment with more about black slaves, Red Masters. The ex-slaves were called freed men, and the freedmen of the Indians had reason to dance. 
No, they weren't rich, but since they were now citizens of the tribe, and the tribe owned all the land, there was no need to share crop. Just stake a claim, build a cabin, start a farm. And there was the black vote. Witness this Seminole election in which they counted one candidate's supporters on the left side of the street, the other candidates on the right. To gain control of the Cherokee capital in Tahlequah, chiefs like Louis Downing campaigned heavily for the black vote, as did Chief Spaichi for control of the Creek capital in Okmulgee. The Creeks appointed uh, and elected uh, blacks as judges, uh, uh, attorneys, uh, they were private secretaries, they were members of the council, and of course the three black towns in the Creek Nation had representatives in both the House of Kings and House of Warriors. Silas Jefferson was even elected one of the Creek chiefs and was among the delegation any time that the Creeks had business in Washington. Since there was none of the lynchings or terror of the white South, Indian territory became a mecca for blacks even though many never gained citizenship. At least 25 black towns sprang up, some still around, like Taft, Redbird, and Tallahassee, where on a warm day they still bring out the kitchen table for a game of dominoes. I'm out of here. What? How you get down? I'm, I'm out, out of here. here. Glad you did. I'm there were black lawmen among the Creek Nation Light Horse Police, deputy U.S. Marshals like Bass Reeves, who killed 14 outlaws without ever being wounded. And there were outlaws, killers like Cherokee Bill, part black, part Cherokee, or the Buck Rufus Gang of Creeks and Creek Freedmen. And there were the rowdies. If they got a, uh, enough whiskey in them, why well, they shoot town up? You ever have to run from a shoot up? I have crawled on bed. <laughs> <laughs> my great-great-uncle Willis was among those rowdies. You may recall my great-grandmother Phyllis Pettit's story of how her husband's mother was sold by his Cherokee master. He looked down a long lane after her just as long as he could see her and cried after her. While George Pettit turned out okay, his brother Willis spent 1877 in the national prison for shooting up the capital of Tahlequah. Five years later, it was more serious. In March 1882, the Cherokee advocate reported in both English and Cherokee, murder trial in Tahlequah, the capital. The Cherokee Nation versus Willis Pettit. The transcript still exists today. It seems two weeks earlier, Willis was having an argument with his wife, Julia, when his mother-in-law, Margaret Bird, said something, so he shot her. It all happened in the home of a sick woman that the two women were visiting. Among the numerous witnesses was one Henry Bow, who testified that the day of the murder, Willis had tried to sell him his house and his hogs for $65. He said his wife had quit him. I said to him, that won't make you sell your place. She'll come back again. He said to me, that's played out. And he cursed and said, I'm going to kill Margaret. While Willis did not take the stand, he had a witness, Maria Shepard, support his defense that Margaret was trying to kill him. As I passed her along the road, testified Maria, she said she would have Willis put away in less time than two weeks. But the Cherokee transcripts say the prosecutor asked Maria, what relation are you to Pettit? Not any. Is Willis not in the habit of coming to your house often? He comes there sometimes. How come Margaret to tell you about this? She did not like Willis and did not like me. Why is it that Margaret Bird did not like Willis and you? I do not want to tell about that. I am not going to tell it. The Cherokee advocate reported, the jury returned a verdict of murder, and Willis, that is his name, was sentenced to be hung until he was dead, dead, dead on the 5th of May next. At a hanging in those days, the public came to watch, and the condemned man was among those expected to make a speech to warn some young person against making the same mistake. The newspaper reported Willis went to the gallows laughing. As for his last words, he said, he'd made a mistake. He meant to shoot his wife, Julia. What? Her. The Oklahoma land rush was the beginning of the end for the five Indian republics. 1889, Congress had given to anybody fast enough to grab it much of the land confiscated from the tribes who'd supported the South in the Civil War. Nine years later, Congress made the Indian governments irrelevant by taking title to the land they still held and sending in the Dawes Commission to split it up and allot it as private farms to the individual Indians and freedmen who were members of the tribes. 
At mass gatherings like this, they were interviewed to determine whether they were legitimate tribal members or squatters. In the Cherokee Nation, folks like my grandmother, Lutetia Ford, had no trouble proving their legitimacy and received deeds to their land. She received 60 acres. My grandpa, John Ford, was a non-citizen but had access to land through Lutetia and their children. The Fords, John's parents, Harry and Zerilda, had migrated from Kentucky in the 1870s. But Zerilda had died, and Harry had remarried a Creek Freedman woman, gaining access to land as well. But some of the blacks had no connections, had not married citizens, but had established farms on tribal lands. Now, somebody was about to receive an allotment that included their farms. In the Tallahassee community in the Creek Nation, many of them turned for help to great-grandpa Harry Ford, a Baptist minister, and, says his 85-year-old surviving son Andrew, a prominent farmer. My dad had a big barn, low full of hay, corn, he once had sharecroppers. But he didn't have gas lights, and that proved tragic when he came to Washington, D.C. that day, seeking someone in authority to help his neighbors keep their land. The October 19, 1906 Evening Star reported the story. It said he took a cab to a hotel called the Philadelphia House at 348 Pennsylvania Avenue, which is where the National Gallery of Art now is. It said he asked questions around the hotel. Quote, the visitor said he wanted to meet some Baptist ministers in this city as he thought they might assist him to transact some important business in which he was interested. Then he went to bed in a room which had a gas light. My Uncle John Ford picks up the story. Instead of him turning it out, he blew it out and uh, he became asphyxiated. Then the rumors are that he was really on to something, you know, that was going to benefit blacks and... Maybe it was foul play. Somebody killed him. Yes, now that, that was a rumor. The D.C. death certificate said Harry Ford, age 70s, cause of death, asphyxia. He had thousand more dollars when he left home. When he got back, got it back, he didn't have a dime on him, no way. Naturally, he wouldn't have. In the cheapest caskets they could buy and shipped him back to Oklahoma. As for the blacks Harry was trying to help, they lost out. But all of his and his second wife's descendants received 160 acres of creek land. They became targets for ripoffs by land speculators. And when oil was discovered on Harry's grandson Dan's land, he was essentially kidnapped. Dan, they run him way out towards California trying to make him sell his place and all that. They called them land grafters. Dan was no fool. He refused. Andrew said when oil was discovered on his allotment, he had no problem with land grafters, but later both he and Dan lost their wealth. That's when they got Dan Tucker. The banks went busted and cleaned our ass out. The end of Indian territory meant the end of an era, of 40 years of tribal citizenship for blacks, the end of centuries of self-rule for the proud tribes, the Choctaws, Chickasaws, Cherokees, Creeks and Seminoles. The descendants of those black slaves and red masters after this. We now look at the descendants of those black slaves and red masters and what they're doing today. We start at what was great grandpa Harry Ford's homestead in Creek Country. Home now of the Dean family. The owner, Herman Dean one of about 10 black farmers still left in the area. Another was his brother-in-law, 66-year-old Sherd Parker, the former sheriff of Wagner County, Oklahoma, still living on the allotment his family received from the Creek tribe. Sherd mainly raises cattle. He says he stayed in farming while others have gotten out because of his dad. He always told us kids, if you take care of the farm, the farm will take care of you. We went to the old Cherokee capital of Tahlequah, where the local bank displays its name in both English and Cherokee. I wanted to hear the language spoken, so my cousin, Maurice Shepard, stopped a buddy on the street. Hello, Phil. How are you? You all right? <laughs> his name is Walter Whitekiller, which means one of his ancestors killed a white person. There are also Cherokees named Mankiller, Sixkiller, and Tenkiller. We dropped by a meeting of the five civilized tribes and found most tribes have kicked the blacks out. 
that was uh, one of the things that the Creek people wanted to do was to get it back to where that uh, the uh, Muscogee Creek Indians would have full control. The chief says there were no major complaints, but when the Cherokees did the same thing, 92-year-old Roger Nero filed a lawsuit. And they just re rejected us. Chief Wilma Mankiller says she sympathizes that it was not her decision, but... My job now is to uphold the Constitution. In the federal lawsuit and appeal, the Cherokees won. But among the Seminoles, the historically close relations between black and red have not changed. Uh, have, we have 12 Indian bands and the two Freedmen bands. Lawrence Cudjo, head of the Bruner Band, says it's because Seminoles and their slaves fought together against the U.S. Army. Our forefathers, they died together. Uh, and and, 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 the, and, the, and the, the help that the Freedmen gave the, the Seminoles, the Indians, was so, they made a blood treaty that they, as long as the water flows and the, and the oak tree grows, that they would be a part of that nation. They were just that close. Near Muskogee, we met 76-year-old Napoleon Davis, whose grandparents were slaves of the Creeks. He's a retired carpenter who's building this. Well, I'm trying to build a shrine. They call Oklahoma Creek Treatment Shrine. Mm -hmm. Ded dedicated to the memory of the Creek Treatment. He hopes descendants of Indian slaves will come here to share and record much of the oral history that is so rapidly dying out. We seem like we are people that sit down and wait for other people to write our history and it's not good. He says he doesn't know if he'll be healthy enough or live long enough to finish his shrine but he says his three children have promised if he doesn't finish it they will. Get your pencils ready if you want more information about black slaves red masters. If you would like a book list on this subject, you can write to Judy Lipner, Greenwood Press, 51 Riverside Avenue, Westport, Connecticut, 08860, or call her at 203-226-3571. We leave you today back in Oklahoma with Napoleon Davis, his shrine, and his thoughts. I'm Sam Ford. I'm trying my best to say something that they couldn't say or didn't say, something that they might want to say and couldn't say. So, so that's that's what is what is all about. There's one kind of favor I have for you. There's one.